Hi there, we want to graph this function using transformations today in this video. And our function is f of x equals 1 divided by the quantity x plus 3 squared plus 2. So because we're using transformations, we're always going to start by identifying our parent function. So in this case, the plus three and the plus two both cause transformations. So if I were to eliminate that plus three and the plus two, what would be left would be my function y is equal to one divided by x squared. And that's what we call the reciprocal squared function. Now, hopefully you remember what this function looks like but if not, don't worry, I'll review it here in just a second. Before I do that, let's identify the two transformations that have occurred. So our first transformation is from the plus three that is in the parentheses with the x value. So that x plus three is going to cause a shift to the left, to the left three. And then our second transformation that comes from the plus two that's being added on to the function is going to be a vertical shift and that's going to be a vertical shift up to. So now we want to think about what the reciprocal squared function looks like and then use the shape of that graph to help us graph this new function that's been shifted left three and up two. So let me take a moment to review with you what y equals one over x squared looks like. This is one of those basic functions. It's really a good idea to have a visual picture in your head of what this function looks like without having to do too much work. So if I were to plug in positive one, I would end up with positive one. And if I plug in x equals two, I would get one fourth. And x equals three would be one over nine. So I get these really small y values here as x becomes very large. However, when I think about fraction values like 1 half, if I were to substitute in 1 half, I'd have 1 divided by 1 half squared, which is really 1 divided by 1 fourth, and 1 divided by 1 fourth is 4. So when I put in x values that are very small and close to zero, I get larger outputs. I get really big y values, which means that this graph is going to increase. It's going to increase here as the x values get closer to zero. Now, when I look at x values that are negative, such as x equals negative one, when x equals negative one, I will end up with a positive one output. When x equals negative two, I would get a positive one fourth and so on. So you see that this graph has y axis symmetry. So one over x squared, that's what we call an even function because it has that y axis symmetry. And that symmetry is really helpful then when you take this graph and try to graph another version of it that has been shifted. So next, let's take a look at those asymptotes because the asymptotes are going to be helpful in graphing our new function. So looking at the parent function, we know that 1 over x squared has a vertical asymptote, and that vertical asymptote is the vertical line x equals 0. So for our new function, if we're going to shift left 3, then our vertical asymptote will move left three as well. So shifting the vertical asymptote left three means we have a new vertical asymptote and it is at x equals negative three. I always recommend you graph these asymptotes with a highlighter or a different colored pen because remember, they're just guidelines for us for the graph. Moving on to the horizontal asymptote, the parent function 1 over x squared has a horizontal asymptote of y equals 0. So if we're going to shift up 2, then the horizontal asymptote also shifts up 2. So we have a new horizontal asymptote, and its equation is y equals 2. So I always start with my old asymptotes and then take a look at where the new asymptotes are located. 
Next, I'm going to take a look at what I call the anchor points on the parent function. And on the graph of 1 over x squared, the anchor points are the points 1, 1 and negative 1, 1. And I like to look at these two anchor points and how they're related to the origin here. So from the origin, essentially, we're going up 1 and right 1 to get to the anchor point 1, 1. And then we go a left 1 and up 1 to get to the second anchor point. So if I look at my new graph where the two asymptotes intersect, so right here where the asymptotes intersect, I'm treating that like that's my new origin, if you will. So from this point, I'm basically going to go up one and right one, and I'll get my anchor point, and then left one and up one, and I'll get my second anchor point. It's as if I shifted those two original points, left three and up two, but rather than actually shifting each one individually, left three and up two, I'm just looking at how they're related to where the asymptotes intersect, which was the old origin. So I like to do it that way based off of the asymptotes, the new asymptotes and where they're located. And then really that's enough information to go ahead and sketch the two branches because the branches have to look exactly like the parent function one over x squared. So these branches have to hug both of the asymptotes and they have to pass through those two anchor points. Now, of course, we could go ahead and find additional points like the y-intercept and the x-intercept, and I'll go ahead and show that here because those are always additional points that are really good to include on a graph. So finding the y-intercept is always going to be done by letting x equal 0. So that means we're plugging in 0 into the original function, so we're finding f of 0, which would be 1 divided by 0 plus 3, the quantity squared, plus 2. 1 over 3 squared is 1 ninth. 1 ninth plus 2 is 2 and 1 ninth. So that means our y-intercept, when x is equal to 0, the y-intercept is 2 and 1 ninth. Let's go ahead and plot that point. Let's just see if it's in the proper location according to the two branches that we already graphed. So if we were to go up 2 and 1 ninth, you can see that would be approximately right there. That's about where we had the branch intersecting the y-axis, so that looks good. Now if I move on to my x-intercept, I find the x-intercept always by letting y equal 0. So that means I'm substituting in 0 for f of x. 0 equals 1 divided by x plus 3 squared. And that means I'm going to have to solve this equation. So let me review the algebra with you. We would subtract 2 from both sides. And then we would want to undo the division by multiplying both sides by the quantity that's in the denominator, which is the x plus 3 squared. So those are going to divide out. And then I have to multiply the left-hand side of the equation also by the x plus 3 squared. So now I have negative 2 times the quantity x plus 3 squared is equal to 1. Then I need to isolate the x plus 3 squared, so I'll divide both sides by negative 2, which gives us x plus 3 squared is equal to negative 1 half. But then you'll notice when you square root both sides to undo the quantity squared, you end up taking the square root of a negative number. And that means you have a non-real answer here. The square root of negative one-half is non-real. And we're only interested in the real, the real values here because those are the x-intercepts that we'll see on a, on a coordinate plane. So basically, we get no real solution for this equation. And what that means is that we don't have any x-intercepts. So if you were asked to find the x-intercepts, you could say, there are none, and you just showed the algebra supporting why there are no x-intercepts. And if we go back to the graph, hopefully we realize quite quickly why there are no x-intercepts graphically because of the location of where the branches are located. They're above that horizontal line, y equals 2, so this graph is never going to cross the x-axis.
So you might have done that in the beginning. You might have looked at the graph and said, there are no x-intercepts. But it's always a good idea to have the algebra to kind of back up your thought process. And now the only thing left to find would be the domain and range. So let me include those here. The domain is all of the possible x values. And remember that we will never cross that vertical asymptote of x equals negative 3. So that is the one value that x cannot be. Therefore, our domain would be all values except for negative 3. In interval notation, that's negative infinity to negative 3, union negative 3 to infinity. And then our range is all of the possible y values. And this is kind of an interesting one because if I highlight my graph, remember the graph does go up forever, so we know the y values do increase to infinity. However, this graph levels off. It levels off and hugs that horizontal asymptote of y equals 2, and it never intersects it. So we never get a y value equal to 2, and we never get a y value smaller than 2. So that means that our range is actually from 2 to infinity. And we put a parenthesis on 2 because this graph never intersects its horizontal asymptote, y equals 2.